and so that we can build long-term relationships among the parties to disputes more effectively if they think they're being treated fairly. One problem with these studies, self-reported behavior. So I want to give you one quick example to show that this actually works in reality for real behavior. This is a study done in Australia with adults like ourselves who are arrested for driving while they're drunk. They receive different kinds of disposition procedure. The key issue to us is they all evaluate if they got or didn't get procedural justice. And then the police track their behavior for four years after their case is disposed. And I'm going to talk about years three and four. So what are they doing two years after this experience? This is what we find. If at the time that you deal with the courts, you judge your procedure, which is more consistent with restorative justice, but I won't go into that here, as being fair, two years later, you're significantly more likely to say the law is legitimate. And then in the years after that, you're significantly more likely not to break the law as reported by police records of reoffending behavior. So even if we go beyond what people say and look at other sources of information, we get the same basic argument. Fair procedure, legitimate law, deference. So I would argue that actually there's a lot of evidence that a self-regulatory model would be viable and is clearly a possible alternative approach to the sanction-based culture. I'll extend these ideas into two arenas and talk briefly about two other kinds of research. One is employees in private companies. As you know, we've gone through the Enron era. Everyone is interested in what can we do to get employees to follow policy, to follow rules. Second, agents of social control. The police, the military, how can we get those people not to engage in behavior like corruption or prison abuse? Okay. First, corporate corruption. I'm sure that I could go on at length about the recent corporate scandal era. I won't. I'll just say that we all understand that there's been great interest in what we can do about problems of corporate misconduct. It's interesting that the immediate response was to find a couple of high profile people like Martha Stewart, drag them into court and punish them severely. That's traditional, the sanctioning approach. Let's make real the sanctions. I would say that we might also consider an alternative approach, which is thinking about how to build a better internal climate in organizations so that employees would be more highly motivated to follow rules. But will that work? Well, obviously, employees have values. So the question is whether those values can, in fact, be effectively brought into play in an effort to motivate rule-following behavior. Again, I study this empirically to try to see if this is possible. I look at the characteristics of people's workplace, and then I look at their workplace behavior. I'll talk about two studies. These are on John's blog, so I won't go into a lot of details, but if any of you want all the details, all the methodological details, you can get them very easily. Talk about two different studies. One, multinational corporation, private bankers. These are the bankers who deal with rich people. People don't go stand in line for a teller. They go to a townhouse and they get coffee and cake and they're treated politely by the bankers who work on their investments. So these are high-end employees. The question is, why would they follow rules? And then I'll talk a little bit later about we have an independent check on behavior by interviews with supervisors. Second study, complete opposite approach. This is a random sample of all of the workers in America. They're interviewed about the same thing, the workplace that they live in, its characteristics, their workplace behavior. And then again, for a, a smaller group, we get independent information from their supervisors. Same argument, is behavior shaped by values? Obviously, 
This is a crucial question. Particular, can organizations motivate their employees by the sense that their rules are legitimate? And then again, as in John's work, if the rules are consistent with moral values, does that also motivate compliance behavior? So similar kind of regression analysis, what I talked to you about before, two factors. If I were to break the rules, it would hurt me. One of the nice things about working in an employment setting is people are not just being threatened with sanctions, they also can lose incentives. So it's a broader range of things that we can do to you. If you break the rules, you can lose your bonus and you can go to jail. But still, sanction risk is the key question. And then, do they comply with the rules? And in particular, in work settings, do they voluntarily defer? So as with the police, we're particularly interested in the idea that people might go along with a decision when their behavior can't be observed, when no one will know what they're doing after the authority is gone, because they buy into, in some way, the decision that's being made. And so there's long-term adherence, as in the study we talked about with drunk driving, where several years later, people are still adhering to the law. OK, so simple comparison of two different issues. Corporate employees, random sample of employees, two factors shaping whether they comply and whether they voluntarily defer. High-end corporate employees, both compliance and deference are almost totally shaped by values. Sanctions have very little to do with it. With the broader range of employees that includes more low-end employees, we see still for deferring, I would follow the rules even if no one was observing me, values are central, and then they have a secondary influence on actual compliance with regulations. But in general, lots of support for the argument that values are a very effective approach to trying to get deference. Second kind of behavior, not so romantic. I don't know if law students and law professors really care about stealing office supplies. There's an estimate that in American corporations last year, $90 billion was lost through pilferage, stealing office supplies, right? So companies care if people steal office supplies, even though it's not kind of a sexy intellectual issue. Why do people do it? Again, both of the organizations. The main reason that people are not stealing, taking three-hour lunch breaks, is because they have values, and then a secondary reason, sanctions. So the first part of the argument, values are a route into deference. Can organizations create policies and practices that would be viewed by their members as fair procedures, and will those shape what people think and do separate from the outcomes that they're getting? <coughs> First, can procedural justice shape values? Here, we have the three things I talked about. I get favorable outcomes, outcomes are fair, and the workplace is managed through fair procedures. Two things. The rules are legitimate, and this is the corporate and then sample of organizations, and there's moral value congruence. Okay, so first the thing that's most obvious, legitimacy is always affected by whether the procedures are fair. The same argument we saw in the criminal arena here in organizations. So if the organization has fair procedures, then people are likely to believe that its rules are legitimate and ought to be obeyed. 